Okay, for everybody who's uh, in, we now have five whole people in this meeting, but we've been promoting it on Twitter, so I expect that we'll, we'll have more over the course of the next uh, little while. Uh, Susan Slate, thank you very much for joining us. Now you're sitting at the University of Alberta in your vehicle, uh, uh -huh. across the street from a, one of the, uh, the Wildcat strike events. And maybe you could give us a little bit of your, your background uh, at AUPE uh, and the role you'll be playing and what's going on. Tell us what's going on at the U of A right now. Um, right now, uh, there is a wildcat at this uh, site. Uh, my role is I'm a vice president and I'm one of the elected officials of AUP. Actually, uh, my background, I am a licensed practical nurse. So these are uh, coworkers um, that not necessarily, I, I actually come out of Calgary, but uh, like-minded people and they are uh, fighting for their jobs and the to stop the privatization that was announced um, a couple weeks ago by Tyler Shandro to um, contract out the food services and the environmental and the laundry services and everything else across the province. So it started this morning really early um, at one site and it's just morphed across the entire province. Um, our membership have been on the edge for months now. Uh, and uh, the announcement that happened two weeks ago was just that uh, little bit of fire that lit everything up and, and today's the day that uh, uh, the group of members, the group of workers that started it uh, decided that enough was enough and um, of course we've had masses amounts of people joining and uh, support from, from all over so it's been great um, and I hope hopefully Alberta Health Services and the government is seeing that you know it's time to actually start um, listening to workers instead of just listening to their corporate friends. Well, can you give us any insights into how this wildcat start, uh, strike got started? I mean, uh, how spontaneous is it? Or has this been planned for a couple of days? Uh, what, what do you know about that? Um, no, the uh, I got a call this morning and uh, uh, headed down there. Um, you know, workers have been talking. They've been talking for months. We, you know, um, just as you know, within different areas, um, not necessarily about a wildcat, but just talking about how upset they've been with with what uh, is coming down. Right? You can't you can't hail people heroes one day and then tell them that you know as soon as the pandemic is over, your pink slip's already there and it's and you're going to be gone. Um, it's gross. It's you. Eleven thousand people. Eleven thousand people for a for a government that continues to profess to be job creating all there have been is job killing um so you know, it, it, i i can appreciate that i mean and, you know my twitter feeds are and, and facebook feeds are full of really disgruntled healthcare workers from from doctors to and nurses to all sorts of uh, employers employees sorry and i think somebody said to me the other day that essentially the uh, Kenny government has declared war on organized labor. Healthcare is one of the fronts in that war. And yeah. that's the way workers feel. Uh, yeah. Regardless of how other people feel, that's the way workers feel. And I, I hear that coming through in your comments. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like people are angry. People are upset. You, you can't keep giving and it's not even just it's just you know the job abolishments but also the fact that people are working short they're short staffed they are continually um, being asked to work 16 hour days because there's they're not filling lines right that that's particularly hard um, in our nursing area with our LPNs HCAs you know to continue day after day to be being told you're a hero you're a hero you're a hero but at but you know what kill yourself too, to, to kill yourself working because um, we won't fill lines or they got rid of, you know, temp everybody's a temporary position. And, you know, it, it's just been, it's been devastating um, as, as a, for, as a healthcare worker myself. Um, and I, I couldn't imagine having to, to be in this in the last uh, eight months when, you know, you're continually trying to keep people safe and keep keep the system working and then you have a government and Alberta Health Services that's continually saying yeah thanks for all you do but at the end of the day you're going to be you're going to be out 
you're going to be gone. Well, it seems to me that the uh, the pandemic has is playing a role in this. Like I would imagine, and I and I say this because I, I interview people like Dr. Joe Vipin, that the uh, who's an ER doc at the Calgary Foothills, and he sees a lot of COVID patients uh, on a regular basis, and they're exhausted. You know, eight uh -huh. months is really taking a toll on these healthcare workers. And what he's telling me is that people are, are not only they're tired, their tempers are short, they feel underappreciated, they feel under attack. I mean, this, the, in the middle of a pandemic seems to be uh, the absolute worst time that the government could choose to do what it's doing. Uh -huh. and, and they've been doing it for months. Um, <laughs> right they they they've never stopped doing it and and that's the sad part and two weeks ago when um two weeks ago when when Chandro announced that uh that was that was the powder keg like he they there has been warnings that our members are upset and people are upset and now um and, and then he announced that you know 11,000 people 11,000 jobs are going to be gone there's thousands and thousands of people out of work in this province and you're going to throw more people in and make that job, uh, make that economy even, even worse. Right. And we're not talking about people that are making hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year. We're talking about people that are making 17 to, to $19 an hour as, as a, a food service worker. Um, you know, that that's terrible that you're going to take that off the backs of, of, of those people. Um, right. It's just, and, and selling it off to a, a private entity. Taxpayers are still paying for it. They're still paying that price. Now they're putting profit into it as well. So people are going to be making less money and they're going to be going in and making minimum wage with no benefits, with not, not the pension that they have. Um, but you also are going to be lining the pockets of, of the corporate people that are, you know, lining up to get these places. Well, I, I understand that part of this debate is around and the frustration that the workers are feeling is that it's attack on public health care and that has all sorts of problems uh, from the jobs that are that folks are going to lose current uh, public uh, you know health care workers are going to lose those jobs and with uncertainty and maybe lower wages if they do get hired back or maybe they don't get hired back but tell me what it's like for health care workers who have endured eight months of the stress that comes with the COVID-19 pandemic. And it, it just seems to me like this is the straw that breaks the camel's back. I can't imagine what it's like working eight, 12, sometimes 16 hours a day over, you know, day in and day out. And then suddenly, you know, you're faced with these announcements from the government. Uh, what role is pandemic fatigue playing into this process? Oh, they're exhausted. Um, people are exhausted. They, they are, you know, trying their very, they, they go to work and they do their best like every day. And, and then to know that this is a looming event that is going to happen. Um, and yeah, it's absolutely the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, you, you can't keep asking like, uh, one minute that's environmental services week and the government is thanking everybody for the great job that they do and keeping the hospital safe and keeping patients safe in, in their cleaning and everything else. And then the next day you tell them that you're going to lay them off the minute the pandemic is over or whenever they feel like it. Right. Um, it, it's, it's just, it, it's so, it's so ridiculous. Um, yeah, it, it, this is totally what happened two weeks ago. He made that announcement and, it, and members were even more upset than they already previously were. So, uh, Susan, um, what's going to happen today? I mean, is, is there any agenda, any structure, any strategy, any uh, have uh, union members been talking? Is the AUP coordinating? This is all kind of, I mean, I guess it's the nature of a wildcat strike, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. spontaneous and, and nobody knows what's going on. But, but can you give us a little insight into what might be going on? and what you know the strikers on the, the picketers hope to achieve well um the the biggest thing i guess is is uh, uh, job security um to stop the privatization of of these services to to demand that um these lines that have been vacant and are increasing the overtime and increasing the uh, the work that be filled or at least like it try to be filled there's tons of people that need jobs um and and just um, show that they're not going to just sit back and continue to be um, beaten up, right? Is, is that part of this? Is is that part of this? 
where, where uh, healthcare workers feel like uh, they have been beaten up, they have been bullied, they have been mistreated, and this is enough is enough, and we're now going to send a message to, to our employer, Alberta Health Services, and yeah. their masters, the, uh, the government uh, politicians. Yeah, no, and definitely enough is enough. Um, it, it's come to, like I said, we, we've been holding our members back for months. Um, they, they've been angry for months. And today was just, that was it. Today was the day and uh, they, they chose to walk out and it, it's been the support. Um, I just sitting here, even in my car, there's people just bringing stuff and people in the public and students and um, different unions supporting. And it, it's been really, really good to see. And, you know, that's what Alberta is. Alberta is about people helping each other and, and being sense of community. It's not about um, a, a government that continues to pretend that they're creating jobs while in turn they're just killing jobs and making uh, giving corporate handouts to their friends. Can you just can you describe to us what's happening uh, across the road at the picket uh, at the strike at the picketers? What's going on? If you if you could describe that for us, please. Um, that you know people are just uh, you know there's a little bit of chanting going on. They're talking to each other. They're just standing in solidarity, and that's what's happening um, all the way across the province. It's not just in Edmonton. It's it's everywhere that people are coming together. Um, whether they're in um, our nursing care side or our general support side um, as well as you know there's a lot of questions about um, um, different things and and what's what's going to happen tomorrow or or what's and, and right now um, we're just waiting uh, and any idea how long the uh, the strikes uh, today will last uh, and will it be the same in all the cities I guess if this is uncoordinated uh, we don't know and uh, who knows what's going on in Lethbridge or Calgary or, or wherever. Yeah, no, I, I'm totally, um, we, we've all been, we've, we've all been in our own area. So I, I definitely, um, while people are out and I know that, um, I'm not totally, I haven't had a chance to even talk to anybody really today, except for the people right around me. Well, look, uh, I will let you go. And when, okay. you get, when you get over there, assuming that you have uh, a network or, or a lot of data on your uh, cell plan. Uh, do you mind logging back in and we can, and you can chat with us and maybe even hold your phone up and kind of give us a, a view of what's going on? Sure, yeah, yeah, I can do that, yeah. Thank you sure. very much for this, Susan, Great. really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks everyone, okay, uh, bye. Next we're gonna talk to David Harrigan, uh, who is also with the labor movement. So welcome to, uh, uh, to this seminal event. David, nice to have you here. Good to be here, thank you. Give us a, a little bit of, uh, of your background. And uh, I know uh, you're the labor relations representative for, and I forget which union, I'm, part, I'm, I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, I'm the director of labor relations for United Nurses of Alberta. Great, you're David Kleimenhag as a colleague. D yes. Yes, David and I know each other well. Uh, technically, now, I'm a, technically I'm his boss, but you know, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> well, we'll treat you well then. Uh, so look, David, uh, tell me uh, from the United Nurses, I mean, your members are on the front lines of the healthcare disputes. Uh, they are the folks who are looking uh, after many of these COVID patients, so they're at, at risk. Uh, they are the ones who are being asked to work 12-hour shifts, 16-hour shifts, overtime. They must, uh, every nurse that I've run into uh, in person or in, uh, on social media is exhausted. And I don't, I can understand why they would be supportive of this, uh, of this strike, but maybe you can give us your perspective as the union representative. What's going on from, you know, uh, what are your members feeling? Um, first of all, I, I should say that uh, we represent the registered nurses and registered psychiatric nurses, and our members are not uh, in, involved in job action at this time. Uh, what they're doing is when they're on their breaks, they're going down to, you know, give support and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but they haven't, no, no decision has been made as to whether or not uh, the registered nurses will, will join in the job action. We've been saying to AHS and, and the government, well, not the government because they won't speak with us, but we've been saying to AHS and hoping it'll get back to the government for months that, you know, this is what's going to happen. 
when you, you know, the rest of the world treats healthcare employees like heroes and you decide to treat them like zeros, um, eventually people get frustrated. Now, you know, the, the, the people like the laundry workers, I'm sure got to the point where they said, what do we have to lose? Well, you know, what, what's gonna happen? If we go on an illegal strike, what are they gonna do? Fire us? Who cares? They're gonna fire us anyway, right? So I don't, we, we weren't expecting this to happen this week, uh, but I've been very vocal saying the AHS for months now that, listen, we've got to get start to get serious and, and, and do something here. Well, you know, you're on the inside of the discussions with AHS and, and uh, not government, though you would like to be, to talk to government. But I want to talk about that for a bit, because that seems to me to be uh, the crux of the problem, is Minister Shandro, the, the, his department, uh, the government in general, uh, seem to be pretty high-handed, pretty arrogant, pretty dicta I know, dictatorial is a strong word, but nevertheless, that's kind of how it comes across. Am I describing that correctly? Oh, absolutely. That's certainly how it comes across to, to our members. Uh, you know, I mean, the reality is, is that we have uh, a, a, a good collective agreement. Um, but the reality is all workers in Alberta are paid higher than the, the, the national average. Minister Shandro is paid 22% higher than the average cabinet minister across the country. And that used to be called the Alberta advantage. And for this government to now say, everybody will remain higher paid except for healthcare workers, we're going to punish them. Uh, it, it, all it does is, is come across as uh, not just arrogant, but also uh, just petty. What, why won't they talk to you? Why won't the government talk to you? Uh, we, I don't know. We, do, we don't know. We've been asking for meetings uh, with the Premier and the, and the Minister of Health even before the last election. And the best we can get is they confirm that they've received our, our letters, but th they just will not speak to us at all. Now, uh, as somebody who spends a little time on Twitter, uh, I run across uh, the issues managers from the government of Alberta and the press secretaries and, and you know, they tell a different story. They make it sound like it's all of the union's fault, the workers' fault, and uh, the government is open and, you know, trying to do its best. But that is not the story that you're telling us today. Well, let me give you the, a classic example was, uh, I think it was, uh, just before the, the long weekend, uh, we had asked AHS, have you submitted your plan to the government about what you're doing with the Ernst & Young report? And we were told by AHS, it has not been finalized yet. That was on the Thursday. On the Monday morning at 7 a.m., I received a letter from AHS saying, now that the agreement on no layoffs is no longer valid, we plan on laying off up to 610 registered nurses, 20 OR nurses, uh, I think it was 35 clinical nurse educators. This was a letter from AHS saying they were going to lay these people off. And within an hour, uh, the Minister of Health was on the news saying they're not laying off any nurses during the pandemic. Uh, we've asked for meetings with both AHS and the Minister to try and seek some clarity. The Minister has ignored the request. AHS, actually, we had a meeting scheduled for tomorrow um, to, to discuss and try and clarify this, but uh, it had to be canceled because they're a little busy today. Well, you know, I remember when that came up and I remember your tweet saying, hey, I, I am in possession of a letter. It just arrived on my desk that contradicts exactly what the minister is saying. And, and it, see, it would seem like the minister got, kind of got caught red-handed and it doesn't seem to make any difference. No, it, 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 it doesn't. And, and they won't even, they, would, they just ignore when you point out what you're saying is the opposite of what the letter says. The minister just ignores it and, and just proceeds merrily along. And I, you know, with that, with that sort of attitude, it's not surprising that we're seeing what we're seeing today. Well, look, um, I, I assume you've been doing this job for a little while and you've seen other governments, and this is not meant to be a partisan thing because we, yes, we had an, there was an NDP government before that, but then there was a PC government, a variety of PC governments that preceded the Rachel Notley government. What's your take on this government compared to those other governments? Is, is this a marked departure in the way the government handles healthcare workers? 
I would say it is, and I should say I've been the chief negotiator for UNA for 30 years now, so I've dealt with many, many different governments. Uh, you know, and sometimes some of them played hardball, and sometimes, you know, there was serious discussions, but there was, it appears to, to us that they just don't have any understanding of the concept of labor relations. Uh, you know, somebody who understood labor relations would, would realize, you know, if you announce you're laying off 11,000 healthcare workers in the middle of a pandemic, and then on Twitter they were mocking the fact that these people were losing their jobs, you have to expect <laughs> morale problems and labor unrest. Uh, so the, you know, previous governments, I think, at least understood how the process works. Now, um, I arrived in, in Alberta in 2000 in Calgary. And at that time, my uh, aunt was still alive and living there. And she was a nurse, oh, way back in, I think she trained in the 40s in Saskatchewan and then moved out to uh, Tabor, Alberta in the uh, late 40s or early 50s. And long, as you can imagine, coming from Tabor, a longtime conservative uh, a PC supporter, and along with my uncle, who was a chartered accountant. And uh, I'll never forget talking to her about politics. And the thing that stuck in her craw, she said, I will never forgive Ralph Klein for what he did to nurses in the 90s. Uh, even though I've supported that party, and I was a supporter of Klein initially, he said, I will never, never forget that. And so Klein to me is kind of the touchstone of maybe not the best way to handle these kinds of budget crises and handle negotiations with healthcare. How would you compare the Klein government's approach to this government's approach. Yeah, and, and I need some time, time to think about that. I mean, uh, at least with, with, with Premier Klein when he was in charge, it appeared at least that he had a plan and he had a belief and a belief system. With this government, it almost seems like we want to hurt people seems to be the plan as opposed to like Klein believed, you know, we're, we're spending too much on healthcare. We've got to spend less as opposed to this government, which just seems almost seems to be, let's try and harm people that we believe to be our enemies. Uh, and that happens to be public sector employees. Well, th this is, this is a, a, a point that I, that the labor movement has made over and over and again, which that this is not about, budget. This is not about uh, money. It's not about any of that. This is a government that, uh, that was elected in 2019 and has conducted itself as if it is an enemy of labor. And it, it is, uh, has declared a war on unions. And, you know, in, in past years and with past governments, you could say, well, you know, it's part of the rhetoric, right? Everybody's, you know, right. everybody's having a public battle and, and we expect that kind of thing. I, I'm beginning to think that they're really, the evidence actually supports the, the war on unions, war on organized labor point of view. Oh, I, I, I don't think there's any question about that. Even, even Klein didn't legislate things like this. I, I, I had to laugh earlier today, the, the Minister of Finance was saying, you know, that the, a, talking about AUPE and that they should respect the bargaining process. This is, this is the guy that, passed a law that said, despite the fact that we had a collective agreement that said we had to have a, uh, a wage reopen or arbitration by a certain date, he just changed, the, put, put in a law that says, you know, cross that out and, and that no longer applies. And, and, you know, when we said at the time, when you have uh, two parties involved and one party says, we get to make up the rules and change them anytime we want, but we expect the other side to follow the rules, uh, people get frustrated and, and, you know, somebody said to me early this morning, they, 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 they think this is what, what this government wants. They wanted a, a wildcat strike and this way they can use it to, to even punish the unions even more. Okay. Let's talk about that for a little bit. So uh, this government maybe uh, likes the politics of a wildcat strike and especially during a pandemic. And I, I see it already on social media, you know, uh, the government's and its supporters saying that, you know, this is the worst time to have a strike. What are you doing? You don't care about, you know, COVID patients. You don't care about, about uh, Albertans. And 
you think that that this then I, I guess you just said it, but I mean it seems pretty callous if that was their political strategy to put Albertans at risk to score political points. It it does seem extremely callous, but as I say, I I couldn't imagine any government other than this in the middle of the worst pandemic, certainly in 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 our generation, to come out and say we're going to eliminate eleven thousand jobs in in healthcare, and you know. What they said, you know, only about 600 only uh, registered nurses will be laid off. But then they, but then they were very careful about once the pandemic ends, there's going to be a lot. Uh, there seems to be that they're they're planning a lot more layoffs. Um, oh, now that now that this is very curious to me, uh, David, because uh, okay, let's say that those 11,000 support workers, and you know, the got the argument was made that well, sure, there are 11,000 workers that are employed. By the government now, there'll be 11,000 workers employed in the private sector to do that work. It's really not, you know, it's not a net loss. It's just a transfer from the public sector to the private sector. And I, I suppose you can argue with that, you can quibble that, but that's their narrative. And there's a certain number of people who will buy that narrative. The narrative that I have a real hard time with, that I, I just, I don't know how you defend it, is in the middle of a pandemic, at the beginning, or now well, now well into the second wave, where it's now worse than it was in the first wave, and you're laying off RNs, registered nurses. These are the people who, the, who provide the day-to-day -day care in the hospitals and elsewhere to sick people. That, I, I, I don't know, I, it's, it seems to me indefensible. What? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's, 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 which is, I, I think, why they changed with their, from their initial plan um, over the long weekend when they were initially going to announce massive layoffs of RNs as well. And I think they realized they're not going to be able to get away with that. The public will not stand for uh, massive RN uh, lo loss in the middle of the worst pandemic, and they don't have the spin that they're trying to put the spin on with, with the, the laundry workers and, and that. Now, here's another question for you. Now, you may not know the answer to this. Uh, maybe no one does. But I see on social media again, uh, plenty of doctors, because I've got a lot of them in my, uh, in my followers list, plenty of Alberta doctors saying, that's it, I'm pulling the plug. Or I've already pulled the plug. And I see lots of people you know, retweeting and tagging doctors who are saying, I'm pulling the plug, I'm going to British Columbia is a popular destination because uh, there's a shortage of doctors there. But nobody talks about, you know, nurses uh, leaving and pulling the plug. Uh, is, is the same sort of thing happening and we're just not aware of it? I don't think it's happening to the same extent, but it is happening. Uh, we had a, uh, one of our members called us um, to say that she was decided she'd had enough and she was going to, to, to BC uh, and she needed to, to get some documents notarized so that she was able to get her license to practice in, in British Columbia. And so she went to a, a law firm close by her house to say, I need this notarized. I'm going to work in BC. And, and, and the lawyer's response was, oh, you must be a nurse. You have no idea how many nurses have been in recently uh, getting, this in, getting this done. So I think nurses are, some nurses are leaving, uh, but I don't think it's quite as severe as, as with the physicians. Um, the physicians are in a, this is my opinion anyway, they're in a bit of a different situation in that they're not used to coming under attack by, by the government. I, I, I think nurses, although they're gen generally well supported by the public, we've had previous spats with, with various governments. And, and I think it, the physicians never really have, and I don't think we're expecting to be treated in this way. Well, uh, and I won't, I'm not sure I expect you to comment on this, but this is a, a conversation that I've uh, uh, watched. And, you know, uh, commentators have said, well, in the past, doctors have actually been kind of pro-conservative government because at the end of the day, they're small business people. And, and so that seems to be where they politically gravitate. They're not unionized. The AMA is not a union in the same way that the UNA is a, is a union. And so maybe that goes some you know, distance to explaining why there's a difference between how the government has you know, 
treated nurses union and and the AMA. So now to see the government attacking doctors the way they are, and I don't have any problem as a journalist saying that it's an attack. I mean, it looks like an all-out uh, attack on the on the sector. It seems, is this something part of a larger issue here, a larger strategy in the part of the government? The government has said it likes more, you know, this party has, is openly private health care positive, right? We saw that at the recent uh, United Conservative Party annual general meeting. Uh, the resolution that passed was a 52 to 54 percent somewhere in there, privatizing more health care. So is this, well, I, I guess it, you know, you don't really have to stretch things too much to come up with a, a narrative where the government picks fights with all sorts of healthcare workers, whether it be nurses or doctors or whoever, the support service, because then that gives them the pretext to privatize and move services over to the private sector. A am I off base here or what's your take on that? No, I think I think that's that's our take on it as well. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, I talked earlier about that letter that we got from AHS. It said, as a result of uh, the new move to do more surgery, we're going to be laying off 20 OR nurses, uh, which actually made no sense the first time I read it. And then I realized what they're doing because they want to privatize. Uh, but of course, if I'm a private surgeon, I need nurses to, to assist in, and where am I going to find them? Well, get AHS to lay off highly trained ones. Those people will be looking for work. Uh, so I think, I think it is all, a, 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 all a, a, a plan to, to do far more privatization, whether it's by alienating the current employees or just starting wars and then, and then getting the public saying to the public, see, now, now you know why we had to do this. Now, I would imagine as somebody who's, you know, in the trenches of, of, this, uh, of this issue, you know, you see a lot of things going on behind the scenes that those of us uh, in the, the public or even in the media don't see. And that would, get, you know, obviously shade your perception of, of things and give you a different perspective. And my take on this from what I can see, and this is not my beat, so uh, those of us, you know, regular readers will, will know that. But my take on it from following it uh, in the news coverage is that the government will say one thing and then it will do other things behind the scenes that, you know, sort of out of sight and out of mind. And is that kind of what we're seeing with, with, the, uh, with healthcare, uh, you know, in these issues that we're talking about? That they'll say one thing to the public, but then in real life do something else. It's right, and they don't talk about it publicly. It's not like they they issue a press release and so on. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's that. That seems to be exactly what we're going through. Okay. Well, look, David, thank you very much for doing this. Really appreciate Great. it. No problem. And, and uh, if you have time to pop back in and and give us any uh, insight into the wildcat strike, we'd really appreciate it. And uh, as I say, this is an this is an experiment in real time. And so, uh, any of your colleagues, any of your members, anyone who's uh, on a picket line that you're in touch with who would like to come and join us and give us their perspective, that would be uh, that would be very welcome. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, David. Well, uh, here we are. That was great. I mean, uh, a wonderful first uh, 35 minutes of this event because we've had two people who are kind of intimately involved in the debate. We've had Susan Slade from the Alberta Union of Public Employees representing, she's a practical nurse, and she was headed off to the uh, Wildcat strike at the University of Alberta. And then we have Doug uh, David Harrington, who is the, uh, uh, he's the negotiator, I guess, for the nurses, has been for 30 years. Uh, for the United Nurses Association. So these are people who are down in the trenches uh, fighting this fight and have a very uh, intimate, uh, very behind the scenes kind of perspective that uh, a lot of us uh, won't have. And it doesn't look uh, very good. We can, now I'm beginning to understand, uh, if I didn't before, I understand now why the Wildcats, where the roots of the Wildcat strike are. And uh, while we're waiting, we've got a number of feelers out for people like Gil McGowan at the Alberta Federation of Labor and others who we expect will be logging in and to talk to us. 
and Susan also suggested that uh, or uh, indicated that when she gets out on the picket line, she'll log back in and maybe even give us some live video feed from her uh, her phone. While we're waiting for that, uh, why don't we open it up a little bit and uh, you could put up your mic, uh, sorry, put up your hand there. If I remember correctly, there should be the ability, uh, if you go to the participants down at the bottom of your video window, that allows you to put up your little blue hand and then I can call on you to make a comment. And let's get some of your perspective on this. Well, it's like a, uh, a call-in radio show. And uh, we'll get, uh, so, and if you can't do that, uh, because I'm having trouble finding a blue hand here, then just unmute your, uh, your video and uh, wave at me and I'll call on you and let's have a, a chat and let's get your perspective on what's going on. Omar, Doug, Evan, who wants to go first? And by the way, while you're uh, getting ready, um, I mentioned earlier that this is something that's fairly new. Uh, I mean, it's not just fairly new, it's brand new. I don't know uh, of any other news organization that has used Zoom in this way to cover live events. The plan is that we will have people around the province who are involved in the Wildcat strike, represent folks who are involved in the Wildcat strike, representatives of the uh, of uh, Alberta healthcare workers. Uh, I would love to have uh, the government come on, uh, Tyler Shandro or somebody from the AHS, but uh, particularly, and we'll see what we can do. I, uh, if you're a regular follower of Energy Media, you'll know that uh, I, uh, the Kenny government is not a great fan of mine because I uh, very often comment on their uh, energy and climate policies and quite unfavorably. Uh, always evidence-backed and always, uh, or more often than not, uh, backed up by expert analysis, uh, which is not very favorable to it. So I wouldn't expect that Tyler Shandro is going to be in a great rush to appear on this Zoom meeting. Nevertheless, we'll see what we can do. And um, so let us see if... Aha, we've got some folks who are off to join a picket line. and. Uh, uh, Omar uh, says, is the strike going on because of the pandemic crisis or is it used, used to happen a lot as well? My take on this, Omar, as best I can tell, is that uh, healthcare wildcat strikes in Alberta are fairly uncommon. And this is not uh, the pandemic, I think, and both uh, Susan and uh, David Harrington uh, alluded to this. Uh, they said, yes, I mean, healthcare workers are suffering pandemic fatigue. They're tired. They feel like they've been beaten up. Uh, imagine if you're uh, an RN and you're working 16 hour shifts over multiple days and you rarely get a day off and you get home and you've got, you know, family obligations and, and other kinds of, you know, they have a life, right? And after eight months of the pandemic, and especially now, because we're in the second wave, we're seeing, uh, I think Alberta was up over 500 new, uh, new cases. Uh, uh, if it wasn't Friday, it might have been Saturday or Sunday. And so their, their workload just keeps going up and up and up. And then, so pandemic fatigue, uh, work overload. Uh, Susan made it really clear. Now, Susan Slade, who is with the AUPE and is a practical nurse, made it very clear that this, you know, healthcare workers feel under attack. They feel like they're being attacked by the, the Kenny government. Well, months and months and months of that uh, takes a toll. And so the, the uh, uh, instigators of this wildcat strike are the, uh, the 11,000 or the uh, uh, support workers, maybe laundry workers, or maybe they work in the cafeteria, or maybe they're janitors or repair people, who knows uh, those kinds of jobs. And they basically, according to what David was saying, said, what do we have to lose? What do we have to lose? We're going to get laid off anyway. So if we go out on a wildcat strike, what are you going to do? Fire us? Fire us anyway. Uh, and so they, that, that appears to be the you know, immediate cause of the wildcat strike. 
And then you have all these other underlying issues like pandemic fatigue and overwork and disrespect from the government and on and on and on that are the, you know, the wellspring of, of discontent that, that, you know, got people out on the, on the, uh, on the picket line today. And from what we can see, uh, uh, other news organizations, it looks like these, you know, are taking place all over the province, certainly in the big, in the big cities. Um, I haven't been able to get on uh, social media or check any of the, the new other uh, news accounts lately, so I'm not entirely sure what's gone on in the last hour. But my guess is, from the sounds of it, that this is spreading like wildfire, and we'll uh, we'll see if we can't get uh, Gil McGowan or some one of the other union leaders to come on and give us a, a big, you know, uh, uh, broader perspective. So we're just waiting for that uh, right now. Uh, I think Gil is coming. Evan Kramer, you have raised your hand. So let's. Uh, you're unmuted. Um, you have a question or a comment? More of a comment. Um, just seeing parallels between here and other places that are kind of seeing the anti-labor movement um, is push the workers until they're kind of at that breaking point, make them do something illegal, and then begin calling those workers uh, thugs or whatever you like, and sort of shift the public perception at, to the negative of those unionized workers um, because they're doing something illegal. Um, I just keep seeing it over and over and I don't know if there's anything that really the, the, the labor movement can do to kind of stop that because like you, like they had said, uh, said in the last, uh, last discussion there about they're changing the rules constantly. Um, I don't know. Uh, workers are at a at a, a definite disadvantage here because the government it gets elected it comes in with a mandate it has the legal authority to make these kinds of changes if it chooses it may not uh, many you know workers and others voters may feel that it doesn't have the political mandate the social mandate uh, social license call it social contract call it what you will but nevertheless they have the legal authority to do that they are the ones who control the budget they control illegally control uh, you know the uh, AHS and and other institutions and so uh, what can workers do nothing but show their discontent and and try to rally uh, public support uh, uh, behind them and I think actually they've been from what I can see uh, they can they're doing a pretty good job of it I mean we remember that uh, Premier Kenny and the UCP were elected with 56 percent 54 or 56 percent of the popular vote in uh, on April 16th of 2019 and I saw a poll just uh, on the weekend that showed that the uh, Rachel Notley's NDP was tied with the UCP at 38 percent and I can't remember uh, in I've been around for a while as you can as you can tell and I voted in my first election in 1977 when I was 18 and I don't remember a government ever falling this far, this fast uh, in uh, such a short time. And I, re I lived through the Grant Divine PC government in uh, Saskatchewan from 1982 to 1991, which in my opinion uh, was, at least in my memory, uh, the most corrupt and the worst government in Canada. Uh, <laughs> It's, I, I think that's demonstrably true. You can certainly make a very good argument that it's true. And even Grant Devine managed to win another, another uh, election in uh, 1986. And so uh, there's a, there's a, was a party in a government that did some of the same kinds of things that, um, uh, that the UCP are doing in, in Alberta and didn't fall as far uh, in the polls as the as uh, as uh, Kenny and the UCP have, so maybe that is the only strategy strategy that's available is to bring these issues to the fore, and because they have such an immediate impact on individuals. I mean, you know, if if you're a parent and you th and you worry that your child is going to contract uh, COVID nineteen and may not be able to get health care, well you know, this sort of action is gonna get your attention. 
if you're an elderly person. I mean, in our household, my wife's, my mother-in-law is 94 years old, and we quarantined uh, early, about, uh, I think it was early March. So we're coming up, we'll soon be starting our ninth month of essential quarantine. We, we don't go out any more than we absolutely have to. We don't socialize anything. It feels, if it isn't technically quarantine, it sure feels like quarantine. But we do that because we want to protect the most vulnerable people in our social circle, my mother-in-law. Excuse me. <laughs> so imagine, you know, other people who have elderly uh, parents in their family unit, in their social bubble, and how much they much feel. How much, how, how, would, how much would seniors feel? Those over 70, 80, or, or, or 90. I mean, you know, the ones who are most vulnerable to the virus. So maybe that bringing this to the public's attention through strikes and through, uh, you know, social media and through every other avenue that they can, they can find is labor's only option. And uh, if you have any ideas, Evan, on additional strategies that you think might work, I'd be interested in hearing them. No, not a lot. Uh, it's more just a, a general worry that I see happening is the uh, labor movement seems to be kind of out of options here. Um, and my big concern, even with this, uh, this wildcat strikes are, since they're technically illegal, the, it's easy for the government to frame them all as, as criminals, basically, and uh, try to turn public perception that way. I hope it doesn't happen. But it's my worry. <laughs> well, look, I mean, um, you know, it wasn't long after the wildcat strike started that AHS, the Alberta Health Services, was uh, tweeting out that they were going, you know, this was an illegal strike. That was kind of their their first response. And I guess you can kind of understand that because it is illegal. Everybody mm -hmm. everybody knows and admits that, it, that it's illegal. Uh, but it's interesting that the AHS was was very quick to kind of brand it that and and uh, with, you know, the kind of the political implications that, that come with that. And then I see you know, of course, government supporters are already on social media, you know, calling for the government to enforce the rule of law. And, you know, how dare the, you know, the, you know, the nurses and other, and other staff, you know, abandon patients in their, you know, the most dire time of the, it really is ironic, isn't it? I mean, here, yeah. the, the government and AHS have been beating away on these these poor healthcare workers for months now, and the, the moment that they take some action to protect themselves and protect the integrity of the system, and the first thing they're accused of is, is uh, you know, deliberately or, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, causing potential harm to, to, uh, to health care, to patients. Uh, highly ironic, I might add. <laughs> Frustrating. <laughs> So Evan, are you, are you part of the healthcare system? I mean, what's your I'm not, I'm not even a unionized worker. I just uh, see what's going on, and it's very frustrating because eventually it comes to everybody, right? Um, what, are people, what are people? What are people? For a reason. What are people in your social network uh, saying about uh, you know the approach to healthcare in Alberta? Uh, the Wildcat strike. If if uh, you if you're able to to comment on that, what are what are the folks you know saying about this stuff? Pretty worried. So most of my family is healthcare workers in Saskatchewan, and as you're probably aware, we have our election today, and we're probably going down the same road. Um, so this is likely to be a year or two down the road for us, and I think this will kind of set the tone for it for for what we're going to experience. So there's some uh, unease, I guess. <laughs> Right. You know, that's, that's fair. I mean, I, I'm on, I've written at, you know, editorial uh, columns about this kind of thing, and I'm pretty much on the, the record, is that these, this, these are not conservative governments that we're talking about. These mm -hmm. are reform style governments. And anybody who was around in the 90s, when reform uh, w was created, and came to some prominence in the uh, uh, in Saskatchewan and Alberta, basically, and I guess some in BC, and began electing members of parliament on, uh, led by Preston Manning, will remember that the reform at that time was very different than the progressive conservatives that they were trying to shove aside. And the, the old red Tories, uh, I mean, 
you know, I voted uh, Red Tory a couple time, couple time or two. Uh, I voted in 1988 for uh, for uh, PCs federally because I was a supporter of free trade. I thought that was a good idea. And uh, and actually, there's a funny story uh, behind that. Um, I was a, a reporter at the time and uh, working at the Prince Albert Daily Herald uh, in Saskatchewan. And I got, I got offered a job after the election by the member of parliament who actually won that, which was the NDP member, uh, Ray Funk, for Prince Albert Churchill River. And he came to me and he said, well, you know, I want to give you, offer you this job. And as much as I love journalism, I was also a single dad at the time, and it's pretty hard raising two kids on the, uh, I think we were making uh, $1,350 a month was what, you know, a reporter made at the pre It was It was pretty tough. It was some lean times. So I took the job, but before I took the job, I went to Ray and I said, look, I, I got to tell you, I mean, as you know, I, while I'm sympathetic with all, you know, many of your other issues and, and would have probably voted for you under normal circumstances, I voted for your opponent on this one because on the free trade issue. And he looked at me, <laughs> I'll never forget the look in his face. And he said, okay, I, I still want you. And so I went to work for him and it was, it was fine. I spent three years with him. But uh, you, I, I remember Canadians could do that. They could go, they could vote NDP, sort of blue NDP one, one time, and they could vote, you know, red Tory another time or liberal in the center, depending on policies and issues and so on. And, and that was, worked really well in this country for a lot of decades. And then the Reform Party came along and with its more socially conservative and more Republican kind of agenda and pulled the political system, you know, the political continuum way, way off to the right and dragged, you know, the, they call it the Overton window. The Overton window is that, if you look at the political continuum, it's that little box of where, what is uh, acceptable political discourse in a country. And so in Canada, it used to be very much centered around the middle. And uh, you wouldn't, you know, it wasn't uh, politically acceptable maybe to talk about uh, Marxism on the, on the far left. And it wasn't very politically uh, acceptable to talk about, you know, Milton Friedman way off on, on the right and the neoliberal, you know, sort of Reagan style uh, voodoo economics. And, but it was, we were all very much clustered in the middle. And then along came the, the Reform Party and the ver provincial variants of that. And they dragged that Overton window way off to the right. And you saw Kenny do that very deliberately during the election by demonizing the, the, the centrist Pemba Institute. There is not another environmental think tank in Canada that's as middle of the road as the Pemba Institute. But Ed Whittingham, the former executive director and the Institute itself, were demonized as radical leftist eco-terrorists. That's what the premier and his supporters called them. And the, uh, the reason for that is that if you make the center the far left, then everybody sort of migrates further to the right and further towards, towards Kenny. And so you can see that, I think it's, it's you know, it's, it's not a radical argument to, to I point that out. I mean, this is, you know, political scientists have been talking about this since the election. But what that means is then that the government has set itself up to do more of these far right wing kinds of uh, public policies like privatizing healthcare and attack unions and, and those, the, the non-center kind of policies, there were 70% of Canadian support. They want to go, they can do far, they, they can do more extreme right wing reform style kinds of policies because they now believe they have the political mandate for it. And I would argue uh, that they, their fall in the polls has demonstrated that in fact the, the public support for those kinds of policies is a lot smaller even in conservative Alberta than they think it is. Now whether we'll, we'll see, I would expect that that support will rebound uh, by you know 2023, the next election, but you know, what, this is what we're seeing. I, I, this is my kind of perception of it. Yeah, and uh, we, we're seeing it on, I see it in energy and climate policy all the time. I see it, uh, and that's, you know, area I report on, it's my beat. And so what I see in energy and climate 
is essentially being replicated uh, as far as I can see in, in, in the health and even in education. And the only thing that's mitigated the, what uh, the energy and health, sorry, energy and climate policies uh, of this government is the fact that there's a federal government that has a different agenda. And it has a lot of, it is the senior government. It, it holds the purse strings on a lot of these, it, on these uh, climate policy areas, energy policy areas, carbon taxing. It, it, has, it has the legislative authority, the constitutional authority. It has the spending powers. It has the, the big red checkbook that it can bring to bear on this. And it has forced the Kenny government to moderate its policies and, and to compromise uh, on things like the large emitters tax, which it wanted, it basically wanted to gut, and it now has had to uh, put in this kind of watered down version of what it really, really had in mind. Uh, you see uh, on the methane emissions uh, regulations, uh, uh, the uh, the provincial government submitted a set of regulations for equivalency uh, recognition with the federal government. They submitted a set of regulations that were really weak and tepid compared to what uh, the federal government needed. And so they went through some negotiations and, and there was some compromise and Kenny's government had to, had to essentially change its, its view on that. And then the other thing, of course, that's, that's dragging them in the other direction or mitigating what they wanted to do is this general trend, uh, you know, which now is, you know, the 2020s are going to be a very disruptive decade. And that is around uh, climate risk for starters and the financial institutions, the fin investors are demanding that there be climate risk and that there be set of any jurisdiction in which they invest. They want there to be a, a robust set of climate policies because they, they require that in order to mitigate this, the climate risk that they've identified. And so the message is finally getting through to both the industry, but particularly finally one hopes and suspects to the premier who's going, because he said uh, at the AGM uh, recently, he said, we need climate policy in order to get projects financed. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So the money, finally money got Jason Kenney's attention and now he recognizes the need for climate policy because nobody will, will, will fund a, a, uh, an oil sands project or a uh, new SAGD development or a pipeline or any of that kind of stuff unless there's a robust set of climate policies. So now how does all of that relate to healthcare? Well, the federal government can't do much because the federal government is restricted by the constitution which makes health the delivery of healthcare a, a provincial uh, situation and there are funding formulas set up for the federal government to provide healthcare. So we don't have that uh, that force uh, mitigating what the uh, the government might try to try to do. And uh, secondly, there isn't a lot of public, uh, I don't think there's a lot of, there aren't any great trends in this area like there are in climate and energy policy, again, where they're coming up against private investors or they're coming up against political and social pressure from outside the province or outside the country that they have to take into account. This is really a made in Alberta kind of, kind of issue. And therefore, if for those who don't agree with that and want to defend the kind of healthcare that, that Alberta has traditionally had, and I guess Canadians have traditionally had, it has to be a made in, in Alberta opposition. And that's why for me, the, uh, this uh, wildcat strike is so significant. This, this seems like there's a spark here. And this is why, we're trying to provide some news coverage of this, uh, even though this is not our beat, is because it seems to be something bigger. It seems to, you know, the, um, the uh, kindling has been, you know, they're ready and it's been waiting for a spark and it feels like this wildcat strike is that spark. And we'll see if that turns out to be the case. It might not, this might fizzle out and, 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 uh, and not, you know, be anything. But boy, there's a lot of anger. And anger is usually the fuel for that kind of you know, political conflagration. And so uh, I would say all the conditions are there. And if, it, if it, this wildcat strike is not what does it, then I suspect that there will be something in the near future uh, like it or you know, maybe another strike that does provide the spark to set you know, Alberta ablaze 
uh, on this particular issue. Because man, I cannot think, uh, I cannot imagine uh, a provincial government surviving or maintaining its popularity by doing what it's doing to healthcare in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of the worst pandemic in a century. And I do have a dog in this fight because uh, my uh, daughter and her husband and her uh, uh, my th soon to be three year old uh, granddaughter live in Calgary and uh, my daughter's pregnant. She teaches at the CBE in a, a school up in the Northeast. My daughter, my granddaughter goes to uh, daycare every day. My son-in-law is an engineer, works for the city of Calgary. He goes to work every day. They are at risk. They haven't got it yet, but they're at risk. And that worries me, worries me a lot. My son lives in, in, Cal in Calgary. He's an apprentice chef and he goes to work and he goes to work in a kitchen and they don't wear masks. And, you know, the restaurant industry is infamous for the way it treats its employees and how it, you know, kind of, you know, we suspect that, that the, the, the level of protection is not what it should be. We worry about that. So all of those worries, even though know, we don't live in Alberta anymore, all of those worries uh, are keenly felt here. I can only imagine what Alberta residents must feel and how important this issue is to them and how angry they are. I see that anger all the time on social media and the folks, you know, the friends I have there, well, all my friends. It's kind of ironic. We've lived, we moved to 10 years ago and I, and still all of my friends are in Alberta. All our clients are in Alberta. I live, my body's in Parksville, BC on the, on the, on the Island, but my head is in Alberta, you know, almost 27, 24 seven. So I know far more about Alberta political issues and, and other issues than I do in British Columbia. I'm a really bad BC citizen and a bad BC voter. But nevertheless, I, I, I feel it. I can, you know, even at this distance, I'm plugged in enough that I, you know, that anger, that resentment, that fear and worry is a tangible thing. And it's a, and, and that's the kind of stuff that provides a spark to that political kindling. And so uh, we'll see what happens. But, you know, it's not like the Premier or Minister Shandro to back down from this stuff. This is, that's not their way. They, 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 they take the Trump approach. They double down, they triple down, they quadruple down. They just keep double, they just keep going in the same direction, no matter what, until they come up against, I guess, against some implacable object or obstacle that they can't mow down or, or get around. Yeah, yeah, That's the way they do it. So anyway, sorry, uh, go ahead, Evan. I've been blathering. Your, your statement there about it being a made in Alberta problem without all those ex externalities coming in and affecting it, that kind of gives me some little bit of hope that maybe, yeah, this can be the one that actually can change the pattern and uh, get some public support, even though it's um, not by the book, I guess. <laughs> no, it really isn't. And I think what we're going to do now, folks, we've been doing this for an hour. We had uh, Susan Slade from the AUPE uh, on first for 10 or 15 minutes. And then we had David Harrigan uh, from the, uh, from the uh, United Nurses Association, who's their, their lead negotiator for the last 30 years. And he gave some great insights into what goes on behind the scenes in discussions or, uh, well, lack of discussions with the government. The government refuses to talk to, uh, to unionized healthcare workers, apparently. And uh, so there was very, very interesting insights, but we're now we're into this. We haven't had any other folks uh, either uh, attend to view or to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, any sources that come be interviewed. And I suspect everybody's out on the, uh, on the picket lines. So what we're gonna do, because this is all very new and, and we're a big experiment for us, we're going to stop now. We'll put the video up on our YouTube channel, uh, E-N-E-R-G-I uh, Media on YouTube. You can find us. We'll put it up there and then we'll come back in an hour, two or three, and we'll line up some interviews and we'll have something, uh, uh, we'll have something else. That, and so watch Twitter, watch uh, at Political Ham on my Twitter or watch on Facebook, both um, uh, where well, you can find me on the search for Mark and Hislop. And then you can come back in and, and uh, hopefully we'll have some interesting interviews. So thank you very much for coming out and we will hopefully see you in a few hours. Thank you.